so SAFE are conducted this research on the complexity and challenges of land issues, particularly in the north, yes, uh, during right. the period of July and August 2011. So um, some of the findings were with regard to the vulnerable groups that you identified during the study. So could you start off by giving us a, a short description of some of the main groups that yeah. were identified there? Sure. Um, what we now we approached the study from a, a vulnerable groups that are that have come to being as a result of land related issues. So when you when you take, I mean, we are talking about a, a, a land that was affected by a 30 year uh, old war. So that means, I mean, people are vulnerable in different um, ways, different angles, and, and because of different reasons. For example, the soci if you take the socio-economic side of it, um, people have lost their livelihoods, their livelihood-related assets. Some people have even lost household members that were, you know, the breadwinners. Uh, so that is the overall, uh, you know, a generic picture of, of the North and East, if you take. Um, but what we were interested was um, the, the land issues, the land-related issues that were causing a bunch of people people to be vulnerable. Um, now our approach, our focus um, in the study was on, uh, because I mean we started the study, we initiated the study because we felt that uh, some a group of people were falling off from the, the whole reconstruction, rebuilding uh, process that is taking place in the north and uh, in the east at the moment. Um, for example, if I, if I give like a very brief example, um, we saw that um, for housing schemes for people to be given new houses, for example, uh, the the development actors, the non-government and government actors, were sometimes uh, asked were asking for documentation to prove that they own land. Now, in, we know that the loss of documentation uh, during the displacement and during the war is a serious issue in the north. So we found that people who could not prove with a document that they own land were being uh, left out from this development, from this whole rebuilding process. So that is, that is the, uh, those, those are the kinds of people that we were interested in that, and that we looked at in okay. this study. Okay, so uh, other than those most commonly categorized groups such as sort of women mm -hmm. um, and other fam mm -hmm. disabled, families with disabled people, mm -hmm. other than that there were also some um, evidence with regard to like competing claims between identity groups right. and this is something that has come up in the media. Mm -hmm. Uh, between old IDPs as well as new IDPs. Yes. Could you talk to us a little bit about sure. that? Sure. I think uh, what is quite special about the war in Sri Lanka that one thing is that it was protracted 30 years. And there were different waves of displacement. For example, you can uh, take the people who got displaced to uh, the north in 1977 and in the 80, 80s, 83 maybe, uh, from the south, from the central province, even from areas like Gaul and district who got displaced into the north, right? And in 1990, there was this expulsion of the Muslim community from the north. So the, this, there was this like mass movement of people back and forth. And then like towards the end of the war in 2008, 2009, there was again this whole, again this uh, big displacement that took place. Now what, as a result, what has happened is that some, there are people who are living in, in, in on lands that, that do not belong to them. They've been either resettled uh, intentionally, uh, sometimes by the LTT, or they've, uh, they've self relocated almost, right? So when people from the areas left, from the, from the north left the areas, some the Muslims and also Tamils, uh, what happened is other people uh, got settled in, in this land. So we found, for example, one village in Kilinoji, where uh, that one particular village was, that land was owned by four people, four owners, and there were 335 families living. In, in that area, in that land area. So we're not talking about just one or two families here. We're talking about like, you know, a quite considerable number of people uh, that stand to, you know, be vulnerable and stand to lose out in this okay. uh, process. So in addition to this, some of the material that I was reading up on, mm -hmm. uh, they were also, there was, um, there were people were, people were in, put into a vulnerable position because perhaps because of their perceived links or the links they may have had to mm -hmm. the LTT. Mm -hmm. What was that? I mean, did that come up in your study? Mm -hmm. uh, what I could say is that we definitely came up, came across places uh, on people where they've been uh, resettled 
by by the LTA. So they were given land by the LTA. Now, at the point of time where we went to the field, we weren't also sure what was going to happen to these people. And I, I don't know even now whether uh, anybody could give you like you know a clear answer. Okay, so these people are uh, these people are you know illegal occupiers or what what is their category basically? And in illegal terms, I actually don't know where they stand. And I think that is that is the whole vulnerability issue here, because they they their status at the moment is almost you know it's it's a hybrid i i think it's it's like some, some something like a hybrid kind of idea uh, because no one for sure can say what will happen uh, to to those people and it could be because of perceived links to ltt but it i think it's also because of the the, the incidents that looked in but and and history what happened uh, in that area which is uh, causing this uh, situation rather than you know particular links to the ltt that is that is what we uh, found out so in all, in the study, there was also some factors that you had documented that actually contribute or aggravate this land uh, problem mm -hmm. or the vulnerabilities mm -hmm. that are already uh, there. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of that, something that we've been hearing often now is this excessive land that is being taken over there for military purposes mm -hmm. and the high security zones that are still sort of mm -hmm. intact. So in terms of that, what were the sort of findings that you came up with? Um, again, when we look at uh, secondary occupation, we found that uh, there were private land being occupied by uh, both the state military um, as well as the uh, as well as people like other uh, people who've uh, returned to the area, who've gone into those areas later after the owners, original owners have left. Um, so, and we found that in, in uh, quite a lot, I think, in Kilinochi and Mulatil, um, and also Mana, to a lesser degree, but also in Mana. So what we found was that uh, people, people, the original owners, would would actually lose out on some of their rights at the moment. I mean, they could not access their land, for example, for livelihoods or for their residential purposes. Um, so if they were because of that, they were in a vulnerable position. Um, so that kind of secondary occupation and the issues that are related to secondary occupation, uh, I think, are quite uh, obvious in the north. So the military was occupying private lands in certain cases. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of one one last question. Uh, in terms of recommendations, what have you put forward and how much of it actually depends on state and state reforms? Right. Uh, so I'll just outline a few recommendations that we have. I mean, it's a, it was a broad study, so I'll just give like a, a few okay. brief um, um, points. One thing that we found was that people, when it comes to land-related issues, if there were disputes, they were uh, accessing the local conflict or dispute resolution mechanisms. For example, they would go and talk to the mosque leader, um, the, the, the Kovil priest, um, and they, because they had that some kind of respect from the community, they were able to give some kind of uh, solution. So we feel that these people, these mechanisms, the lo local uh, conflict uh, dispute uh, res uh, resolution mechanisms should be strengthened by maybe giving them some kind of background training on land related issues, land related laws as well. Because again, another thing that we found was that knowledge of land related laws uh, overall was very low with the people, with the general public, with these people who were trying to resolve the disputes, but also sometimes with the land related officers, the officials. Um, so I think that kind of, you know, some kind of background uh, training on land related issues to a lay person, like a normal person, I think would be would be good. Um, in terms of you know land reforms and uh, trying to uh, trying to give like a more sustainable solution from a like a legal point of view, I mean that is not our expertise. As I, as I, I mean we are the center for poverty analysis, so our interest, our focus was from the socio-economic angle of things, and we do acknowledge that the legal uh, focus has like a major role to play in land-related issues. And um, you know there there have been attempts uh, to regularize land ownership, such as the Bimsavia program. Um, which is, I think, by being piloted, was piloted in Anuradhapura, and now I think they're being, they're implemented it in other parts of the country as well. Um, but the thing is, if you are if you're not very conscious about the context in the north and in the east and the war-related issues and war-related complexities in trying to implement these land-related uh, regulations and new reforms, uh, I think it'll be it it it's going to uh, make these people more vulnerable. 
months. Yeah, so that a title registration uh, uh, process, for example, if it doesn't take into account the loss of documentation, for example, uh, and this mass displacement and that the fact that people have been displaced for more than 20 years. Uh, and that they can't go back now and reclaim some of that land. And they might, might not be even in this country right now. So if you don't take all those points into consideration in a formal um, regularizing uh, process, I think uh, it will it'll, it'll, you know, be very complicated and it will it, it, it make the situation even worse than it is right now. Um, so I think um, the state definitely has a, a role to play in it. Uh, while being conscious uh, and sensitive to all these complexities that surround the issue.